Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of PBR TV live sessions. This week we are on episode 10 of our educational series with Paul Glatzel of Powerboat Training UK. Over the last uh, nine episodes we have been taking uh, different topics to get you started into boating, maybe go further afield, push boundaries a little bit, but uh, also to hone in your skills to become a better skipper and be safe on the water as everybody gets back onto the water and enjoys boating again after lockdown. So this week we are uh, covering off on advanced close quarter handling, handling the boat in marinas and getting to know and be more familiar with how a boat handles at slower speeds versus what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago in rough weather conditions. So I'm gonna bring Paul in and we will start with today's show. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? All good. Thank you. So, um, yeah, today we're talking uh, things a little bit more slower paced and uh, starting to talk about um, how to handle the boat at slower speeds. But obviously things affect that like wind and there's different drive systems and things that make uh, a, a whole mix of different equations. So, um, yeah, can you give us a little bit of flavour of what we're going to be talking about over the next 40 minutes or so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think it's fair to say that if you ask most boaters, the bit that ends up being most stressful um, and sometimes the most painful part of it is actually the manoeuvring in and around objects, typically in marinas, slipways, um, be at the start of the day or, or actually almost sort of worse still at the end of the day when you come in tired, uh, you've got everybody sort of keen to get off and maybe go out for a drink um, and you've got a nail getting into a difficult berth uh, maybe with some challenging conditions of wind and tide. And, and what we really want to do in this session is um, to go back and just make sure that you're comfortable, that people have, have got their mind around all of the various different concepts, because you can't say this birth, this is exactly how we do it, because every day you go in, there's going to be a difference. No two days, no two births are ever exactly the same. So by actually just breaking it down into its component parts of how the boat reacts and handles and so on, it's for 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 boating at an advanced level, it's about putting all of those things together and coming up with a package in respect to your response to that berth and those conditions that actually make sure you do a good, safe job each time. Maybe not every time, but certainly the majority of times. And also, uh, a lot of new people to the water this summer may not be uh, so familiar with the heights of uh, summer in places like Hamble, Solcombe, etc., which are such busy hotspots. There's a lot of noise and a lot of action happening. Um, so it's best to be calm and well practiced in in your ability to manoeuvre your boat and um, uh, be familiar with how how things work, so that you're as uh, safe as possible, especially in busy areas where a lot of people could be affected. Absolutely, I think it's. I, th I think the point you're rightly making there is there's pressure. There's pressure from other boats. There's pressure from people on our own boats. And, you know, it's always the case, isn't it? You go into marina and there always seems to be everybody sitting on the back of their boat waiting for you to do something wrong. The reality is they've all been there before. Uh, it's just so happened that they're watching you. And at the end of the day, it's all about moving what we do on a boat from really having to think about it lots towards muscle memory, um, something that just becomes natural to us, just like driving a car. We don't think about changing gear in a manual car. We just do it. The problem with boating is we don't necessarily do it enough to make it muscle memory. And, and that's the challenge for us. Understand what we need to do and then practicing it. And that practice makes perfect. Exactly. So we'll, talk, we'll uh, start off with, we've got uh, 10 or 11 different uh, uh, topics and sort of segments to go through. Um, first off, we want to talk about the sort of natural happy position of uh, the vessel. I'll put up the first slide and if you can uh, chat to us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Yeah, it's going to, after we've talked through this, uh, it comes across as everybody goes, oh, that's so obvious. And it sort of is, but it's not. Um, and I ask the question um, very often on instructor courses or with advanced boats, we put the bow into the wind and um, point the bow into the wind of a boat, uh, of a power boat, um, and say, right, what's going to happen? Is the boat going to stay pointing bow to wind? Is it going to come round to side on one way or the other, port or starboard side to the wind, or is it going to come round stern? Uh, to the winds. And, and I think it's fair to say there's never a universal answer to that. Um, 
when you start to think about it, it sort of starts to become obvious because when we stop um, in our power boat, our motor cruiser, then the boat always ends up leading side on to the waves at 90 degrees to the wind direction because the boat sort of, you, you feel it doing that and it becomes sort of quite, uh, quite unsettling sometimes. So I tend to refer to that as the boat's happy position. The boat is only happy when it's lying beam on to the wind. So therefore, when the boat is bow to wind, it's fighting you the whole time to come beam on to the wind. And how quickly it comes round will vary boat to boat. Um, four berth family cruisers with very light bows, heavy back ends or big ribs with big long bow areas. The bow can come round in, in any condition, you know, force four, force five wind in literally three, four seconds, really catches you out. One of the the things that then really catches people out is what's going to happen stern to wind. So if the stern is to the wind, what happens? And actually, it really surprises people how if they position their boat stern to wind, how quickly that boat, the bow will roll upwind and it will lie side on. Now, if there's a big cabin area at the back, somewhere that the wind can get into, then quite often the boat will sort of tend to be pushed downwind quite a lot. But as soon as the wind gets one side or the other, the boat will rotate. And sometimes that's very quick. So why is that important? Well, if you understand that's going to happen, then it's a predictable consequence of having the bow of the stern into the wind. Equally, if you're already side onto the wind, then the boat's not going to rotate. So it's a characteristic which you can use to your advantage and you may need to manage. But if you don't know it's going to happen, then it's going to catch you unawares. Exactly. So this leads me on to uh, what we were just talking about, having uh, uh, the wind to stern. I'm just going to bring this up now for us. Um, so, yeah, can you shed a little bit more light on, on this and how the boat would handle um, uh, in, this, in this condition? What the, the, there's advantages, obviously, also um, putting the engines in uh, a stern against the wind. But, yeah, can you talk us through a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, you highlight a good point in so far there are advantages than there are. So bow to wind, the bow invariably comes around fairly fast. Stern to wind, uh, it can come around quite fast, but it's takes a lot less physical input of steer and gear, uh, whether you're on uh, an outdrive, outboard type boat or shaft drives. Um, irrespective of the drive system, um, it tends to be a lot easier to hold the boat stern to wind than bow to wind. It takes a lot less effort. So why is that important? Well, I'd look at that as your get out of jail free card. So you're in a close quarter situation in a marina, you're losing the bow, it's going, don't worry about it. Just make sure the bow's not gonna crash into anything get that bum, that stern of the boat into the wind and just let things settle down. And what you need is thinking time. And because it doesn't take much effort to keep a boat stern to wind, then you've got thinking time. And that's freed up brain space for you to be able to go, right, what I now need to do is X, Y, Z, whatever that actually proves to be. Whereas if you're trying to hold the bow into the wind in windier conditions, that can be quite hard work. So it's just have that as, in your back pocket as a, as a get out of jail free type card that you can play if you need to. Do you think also that helps because there's there's added weight in the stern traditionally with engines and et cetera that it's keeping it more planted into the wind? Um, Absolutely. Um, and it's to do with the shape of the boat. It's to do with pivot points. It's to do with where the weight is and the very light uh, bow of the boat. Um, different boats handle in different ways. And if you've got a more mid-engine type boat, then there's more weight towards the center. It will still come around to lie beam on. Uh, but the speed at which it does it uh, varies. I think the point with this is whatever boat you've got, whatever boats you go out in, just do this. Go out in a little bit of wind through to a lot of winds and see how the boat reacts because being able to put that away in your back pocket is a little bit of knowledge that what the boat's going to do in this situation is. And then quite obviously what we need to do is be reading the wind and the tidal conditions so that we can understand what's actually uh, how the boat's actually going to be affected in those conditions. Yeah, and uh, we've said on many different episodes that uh, seat time is, is paramount. So like you say, maybe choose a, a middle of the week, say if you're on the Solent in, in Hamble, say for example, where it's going to be maybe a little bit quieter than on a Saturday sunny afternoon. Um, uh, yeah, and just spend some time practicing some maneuvering and obviously do things slowly and, and not... Absolutely, and, and you pick up on what we, we as instructors are really good adage, which you don't want to look at it quite like this, but if you're going to crash, crash slowly. Um, things tend to go wrong in marinas because people put lots of power on to solve a problem. And rarely does it solve a problem. It, it tends to just make the uh, keep the gel coat fixers in business. Um, so 
deal with things slowly. And, and you need to be able to deal with things and practice away from the glare of everybody. And, and, and we don't get good at, practice, at doing stuff because we practice it once or twice. We need to do something 20, 30 times. And that means ideally, as you say, Tom, a, a weekday, maybe initially far less wins, and then you build up over time. And I think we've had that as a theme throughout every discussion we've had is start easy um, and then progress yourself into more challenging conditions. Exactly. And, and also when you're wanting to get into boating, maybe get into something with maybe less windage as your first craft or um, something that is of a manageable size. So, or if, if you're wanting something larger, definitely going for training, etc. So you're not just running before you can walk. Yeah, and, and uh, we mentioned earlier four birth family cruisers, and we're here in uh, a marina with about 900 boats in it. And I think it's fair to say whenever you say to an instructor you're jumping on a four birth family cruiser, um, so like a 28-foot four birth type boat, um, and there's a little bit of wind, you can see the slightly sort of ashen look on their face because they're the hardest boats in the marina to handle. You can have a 60-foot boat with twin shafts and bow th stern thrusters. That's easy by comparison with these smaller boats where the wind affects them. It's not a problem as long as you know what to do and you practice it and then you become in control. It's about you managing the environment, not the wind or the tide managing it. Yeah. We mentioned a minute ago about um, uh, rushing things and going in and out of gear and, 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 and being maybe slightly erratic in a sort of a, a panicked frenzy when people are watching, etc. So that brings us on to uh, steer then gear. So I'll bring this slide up, and if yeah, if you can chat chat to us a little bit about what we what we've got here. Well, if if you've done level two, uh, powerboat level two, then this will be one of the core concepts your instructor will have introduced. And at a basic level two type level, it's it's a critical thing. It's uh, let's get the steering in the direction that when we put the thrust on, we want the boat to instant, instantaneously move. So for example, if we want to turn here in this direction, then if we get the wheel over that way and we put the thrust on, whether it's an out drive, outboard or shaft drive with a rudder type boat, that, that kick will be instantaneous. Whereas if we have the steering that way, and then we want to go this way, and then we're comp it's going to be a slower reaction. So it's thinking, how do I want that boat to react when I put it into gear? It may well be sometimes it doesn't matter um, and actually you go into gear and it's a more gradual turn. But other times, particularly in marinas, where you want the turn of the bow to be instantaneous, then getting the steering where you want it to be can be a key thing. And, and that's true whether that's a single engine boat or twins. Um, on, as we come on to in, in terms of twin shaft, we, we can start to look at some twin handling slightly different. But the concept of steer then gear is really important. You may choose to override it, but it, equally, if you don't see the benefits of it, then you're missing out on a trick in a close quarter situation. Likewise, it kind of tends to slow things down a little bit, doesn't it? Because you're thinking about your actions more and the position of the, 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 the drive or outboard. Um, so you, you tend to be able to analyze things a little bit better don't you rather than just going you know from one lock to the other and, and sort of going in and out of gear accordingly absolutely and there's there's a concept to sort of try and use i was sort of when i'm teaching try to get people to think think the word ape um assess plan execute and what their escape route is you know what's the wind doing what's the tide doing what depth do we have um, and if with a, with a good assessment, their plan actually becomes better. Um, and within that plan, we need to remind ourselves that we've got three gears on the boat. Um, a, a lot of situations arise where it gets a little bit uh, sketchy in a marina because people go from forward to backwards, forward to backwards, and forget they've got that bit in the middle, um, neutral. And neutral, you almost think of it like this. When you're in forward gear, you're eating up brain power. When you're in reverse, you're eating up brain power. When you're in neutral, you've suddenly got a bit more brain space to be able to think through the problem. So actually try and spend as much of your time within reason in neutral because it gives you brain space and actually the boat's then not building momentum one way or the other. And little bits into gear, out of gear, into gear, out of gear can make all the difference. And think about when you're in a close quarter situation. If we guessed, for example, that we needed to leave it in gear for that long, well, actually, rather than leaving it in gear for that long, why not leave it in gear for that bit and then add another bit and then go, oh, actually, I didn't need the bit, but this bit here that I haven't added because everything you add on, you have to take off. So if you add too much, you're going to have to get rid of it somehow. And that could be against the elements or it could be having to go to reverse. Uh, so add a little bit, little bit, little bit. And then it also reduces the amount of momentum you're creating in a close quarter situation. Yeah, because if you're going yeah, straight from yeah, um, forward to reverse or whatever, backwards and forwards like you're mentioning, um, 
the boat will react to prop wash and that momentum that you're talking about. And often you can be crabbing sideways or, or not have enough s steering input, etc., because the boat is actually reacting to everything else that all the propulsion that you're putting into it. Well, you're right. And the boat's wobbling around and you've got so many things going on. What your brain can't do is break it down into what's actually having the effect. You've got too many variables um, and you've got no thinking time. Um, so get to neutral. You've always got far, far more time in neutral than you actually think you have. And that just gives you time to go. Actually, the risk is in front of me. Right. OK, I'm just going to reverse gently into winds um, and stabilize everything while I have a think about what my plan is, what my next move is. And we're going to talk uh, about twin engines next. But before that, um, with um, steer then gear, this is not just single engines, is it? You can engage both engines and come back into neutral, give yourself thinking time. So this isn't just something that should only be employed by single engines. No, absolutely. And what you might find with twin engines is that being in gear on both engines at the same time actually creates too much speed, too much movement. So you'll find certainly some boats you'll have to do alternate which engine you use driving through a marina to diminish your your overall speed and momentum um, but you're absolutely right in terms of the turn and, and we'll come on to this in a moment if we're turning one way or the other and we've got twin engines then we need to think about which engine we use um, and whether we need to dial the steering in as well because in some situations you can not use the steering but there can be a benefit of adding the steering in as well and it's understanding what each of those component parts of the equation actually are. OK, so I'm going to bring that one up and then we can we can go through that. So, uh, yeah, here we see a, a diagram of inside and outside engine. Talk us through how a boat reacts uh, accordingly where you're putting power on uh, a starboard or port engine. So so what we've got here is is uh, the sterns of two boats uh, turning. Um, and what we're trying to do is to show really the leverage effect. And what we mean by that is the offset from the center line of the boat. So if this is the back end of my boat, where we've got a single engine, then that's going to be right at the center of that stern. Um, and it's if we're straight, it just pushes us straight, doesn't it? Um, whereas if we've got uh, an engine one side and the other side, when we come to push on one side, it's going to have a turning effect one way or the other. And it doesn't matter whether that's outdrives, as in effectively outboards where the engine is inside the boat and the, um, the uh, stern drive unit is on the transom, or whether it's shaft drives. Either way, that offset from the center line creates a turning moment um, in the boat. And that's, that can be, work to your advantage. So for example, if we're going to turn this way, then which engine uh, is going to have best effect? Well, it's actually going to be the one on this side, isn't it? Because it's offset from the center line. So we're going to gear on the one on this side, and it's naturally going to push us that way. And that's without any steering. If we then add the steering in as well, and we turn the steering wheel that way, whether it's a rudder or it's an outdrive, then that's going to increase the tightness. It's going to tighten that turn up. So Therefore, we can choose which engine we use. Sometimes we might want a very slow turn, and maybe actually the inside engine actually does a job for us. But actually, most of the time, we'll probably use the outside engine because it creates greater, or gives us greater leverage and creates a tighter turn. So therefore, if you're used to using a single engine boat um, and doing maybe a turn in a confined space, as you would have learned to do at powerboat level two, then actually when we come to do that in a twin outdrive or um, a twin outboard type boat, then actually, if we're going that way, will you, if we're turning to the left, we're going to use the engine on the right. Uh, so in this case, turning to port, we're going to use the starboard engine for forward, but also for a stern because it's got that same leverage. So it's just thinking about that leverage and trying to use it to our advantage. With um, maybe a single uh, uh, engine craft, you also have, uh, well, you have it with twins as well, um, but for creating better leverage as well, you have the option on some craft of a bow thruster. Now, we haven't got a, a graph right now, but obviously it's a, a little propeller um, that's uh, uh, molded into the to the nose of the, of the craft and some also on the transom. Uh, this gives you a, a different ability as well to be able to crab the boat and control it as well. The, Absolutely, and, and bow thrusters are great. Uh, I, I don't subscribe. Sometimes you get... Uh, salty old sea dogs or people in marinas go oh you can't use the bow thruster it's cheating well 
if you paid four grand for it to be in your boat, you might as well get some value for it. Um, so it's not cheating, it's a tool. And I think you've got to think why you're going to use it. So if, you, if you're going to use the bow thruster to achieve the entirety of the turn to sort of effectively have a propeller that's pushing the bow that way, then actually what you should do is go back and actually understand how to achieve that in your boat without using the bow thruster. And we've used the phrase already, get out of jail free card, and the bow thruster becomes the bit to tidy up or to solve a small problem. Um, it's, it's a noisy tool generally because it's vibrating in the bow of the boat. Um, so it attracts quite a lot of attention. It's drawing a lot of current um, and that might be dedicated batteries or might be off uh, your batteries used for, for service uh, or start and that might cause you an issue. Um, so treat it as your, your extra bit, the bit that's gonna help you out, not the be all and end all. Um, but equally, if you have a major problem with your engines, I've known people who've managed to get boats alongside using the bow thruster on one engine or uh, two bow thrusters and just get alongside a pontoon. So, you know, don't hesitate to use it full on if you really need to. I like that point that you use of using it to tidy up and not just being dependent on, on that, because if you're just using that, you'll forget your knowledge on using your engines accordingly and properly. I tend to use it where, say, for example, I'm in a motor cruiser. Uh, and um, uh, you know I, I'm a stern towards the, the the current or whatever coming to a pontoon, so I'm, I'm coming back in and I'll use the outer engine in reverse to sort of crab the boat in, and then I'll just use a little touch of bow thrust to just to stop the nose drifting and bring it alongside parallel or something like that. So you're just using it, like you say, just to tidy up and and uh, keep things accordingly. No, you're absolutely right. And I think it's really important that people don't feel there's any shame in doing that. You know, just don't subscribe to that at all. Um, there's, you know, these tools are there for a reason. I suspect the only, a, a good rule of thumb I would have for using a bow thruster is use it for a second and then a second and a second. And it, so it's therefore the addition of a few seconds. The only exception to that would be nowadays you'll get, um, I was on recently a, a twin outboard boat um, and you even get twin shaft boats where they've got thrusters and then you've got joystick control. Um, and the joystick will actually bring all of those things together um, and actually sometimes use quite a bit, a bit of revs to actually achieve the objective of moving the boat around. There's nothing wrong with that, but what you'll hear is quite often the thrusters running slightly longer um, and they need to, to effectively pull all those different forces together to get the boat moving where it needs to. But bearing in mind, you can make the boat move all over the place or with these joystick controls, then you know that's a good thing anyway. Yeah, you've got uh, IPS, haven't you? You've got the Mercury uh, Skyhook system um, and uh, a lot of other uh, manufacturers are doing that uh, as well. I, I think even Seastar have their own aftermarket system for like twin outboards, etc. So that is it, it, It's fairly amazing. I don't know if people should go online and, and have a look at maybe some of the YouTube videos or you might we might be able to do one in the future. But actually, the most bizarre one I see is where you're on a boat with two outboards and then the outboards go in different directions. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. boat goes sideways. I just look at it every time and it still amazes me that we can actually do it. So it's, it's pretty impressive when you watch it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's going to bring us on to uh, our next bit. But before I actually do that, something's popped into my mind regarding bow thrusters. If you have a boat that you are um, is fitted with a bow thruster and it's, it's a new bit of kit to you, make sure that it's not just in standby mode. If you are um, coming to a um, a berth or a, yeah, a pontoon or, or you feel that you're going to possibly need to use it. Um, there are usually two buttons you hold down or one or whatever the system is, uh, but make sure there's a green light maybe in um, a little bit more of open water, just give it a quick blip um, so that you know that if you do need it, you're not suddenly using a dead stick that's just gone into a, a standby mode. Um, and, and like you say, you could, I, I've seen people almost burn out their, um, their thrusters or it's cut off from a heat overload where people have been overworking them, Paul. Have you seen that type of thing? Well, we, we in the marina here a few years ago now, a boat caught fire after overusing the bow thruster. Um, and that was, um, and the front cabin burnt out because of, and that, that's going to be a wiring issue. So, you know, people shouldn't unduly worry about that. But uh, you almost speak from experience, Tom, there in terms of the bow thruster having switched on or off at the most inopportune moment. <laughs> yeah, it's happened a couple of times. Yeah. You and me too, rest assured. Yeah. Um, so uh, moving on to the next bit, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, pivot points. So I'll um, show, show this uh picture here that's from the uh, handbook that you um, were an author of for the RYA. What are we um, seeing here? Obviously, uh, the uh, port uh, stern is um, hitting the pontoon, but why, why is this being caused? 
Okay, so if we think back to our sort of basic training and probably one of the things we would have done on our level two course, which would have been driving around mooring boys in a figure of eight type style, then one of the concepts that's trying to show uh, to people learning is the, the concept of pivot points and the way that a boat rotates. And when we're driving forward and we turn left or right, port or starboard, then the boat will rotate around effectively a pole through the boat pretty much in the position of, of the helm. So about a third or somewhere between a third and a half back from the bow of the boat. When we start to reverse, um, then that pivot point moves off to, to really just forward of the engines, that sort of third forward of the stern. And I think it's just another one of those things to have in our back pocket in terms of knowledge, which is how's the boat gonna rotate? Um, so we're starting to maneuver around in more advanced conditions with a bit of wind or moving away from berths. And we need to think, it's very easy to be focused on, right, here I am with the wheel and the throttle, and I'm gonna turn this way or that, but what's going on behind you? And this image is just showing that classic example of someone turning, in this case, to starboard to move away from the pontoon, going forward, and the back end just bouncing along that pontoon. Um, potential for GRP or tube damage or whatever. So it's, it's thinking, how does that boat handle nicely? So in that situation, 99 times, 95 times in 100, I'd be, turning yes to starboard, but reversing away from that pontoon. So S shape into the middle of the water and then go off forward. And I think it's in the, at, at our level two level boating that the people watching this are seeking to move forward from, from perhaps it's sort of, well, let's push off and drive off and quite often in a little boat. Um, but actually we need to have this technique in our back pocket as well is actually thinking, how's the boat being pushed around by the wind and tide? Can I move away? Uh, forward without the back end potentially hitting. And a good rule of thumb is if you're looking over your shoulder worried about what's going on, go out a different direction because because you've probably made life more difficult than it needs to be. And like we were saying about uh, doing things slowly earlier, the, the amount of times I've seen people that have um, maybe um, been blown on to a pontoon or something, they're in this position and they're about to, um, you know, they're a foot away, you know, say maybe the the end cone, cone on the uh, end of um, a sponson, etc., and they're about to hit. So their first reaction is speed up and turn more aggressively, and then you end up seeing them, you know, wipe down the side of the pontoon or hit another boat or, or whatever. So. Um, yeah, speed is not necessarily your friend in this situation. No, and, and that comes back to that point, you know, it does go wrong for all of us. Um, you know, the, anyone that says it doesn't go wrong for them is just lying, frankly. Uh, it goes wrong for me. Uh, I'm sure once or twice in your esteemed career time it's gone wrong for you. Um, and it just happens. Uh, so that comes back to, first off, if, it, if you're going to crash, crash slowly. Um, and at the end of the day, it's only GRP and tubes and things like that. Don't risk your hands, your legs, your arms, dangling children over the side of the boat. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, protect protect the people in preference to the boat. I witnessed a fantastic Japanese engineer, a very, very clever guy, very experienced uh, seaman who works for one of the major um, outboard manufacturers and they had created a, a, a new part of their steering um, system, which, um, uh, enabled you to have better maneuverability off uh, pontoons and on the evening before the launch um, I was with him and jumped off the boat um, he got pinned to the pontoon and even with his uh, great skill and uh, the latest technology that was going to be launched the following morning was still pinned to the pontoon and did this very thing so if some of the the best people amongst us can have this situation then it, it's going to happen to all of us at some point but just don't freak out and deal with it accordingly Absolutely. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, move on a little bit now um, to um, the ability to anchor a stern uh, with twins. So uh, another uh, benefit of twin engines. So if I, I'll pop this on and we can uh, have a little chat about this. So yeah, if you've got a twin engine boat, what, what's the scenario going on here? Well, yeah, what's we, what we've got here is we've got uh, a twin outdrive type boat. Um, and you can see the image uh, to the left there is the the, the boat slightly angled off the pontoon and then where we want it to be to the right parallel to the pontoon. I mean, it just introduces a concept um, and it's the, the concept of uh, being able to sort of effectively lock the stern in a position um, and rotate uh, the boat um, using the sort of technique. So what effectively we've done here is the bow's dropped off a little bit um, and we want to bring the bow back towards starboard, towards the right-hand side. And, and we've gone effectively a stern on the starboard engine 
and we've gone forward on the port engine and we've dialed steering into starboard at the same time. And what that's done is effectively the back end's rotating or the boat is rotating around that back end. Um, and you could think of it as sort of anchoring that uh, stern position. And it's that starboard engine that it's really rotating around. So the port engine is giving leverage because of its offset. It's also got turn on. So that's giving it more effect. Um, and then it's that starboard engine that's sort of just sitting it there and stopping its forward or backward movement. So it's just something to practice. If you've got access to a twin outboard outdrive type boat, um, then give it, a, give it a try because it's just another technique to have in your back pocket. Definitely. Um, with this, people would have um, seen or maybe heard of an expression called uh, ferry gliding. Now, I'm going to bring up the next slide, um, which sort of expands on this a little bit more. Can you um, talk us through what we're seeing here, and what that term means? Yeah, so it's sort of what it says on the tin. Um, and it comes from the concept of if you think of a, a river, uh, flowing with either stream or cur uh, current or, or tidal stream. Um, and if we pointed 90 degrees across from our uh, departure point to our destination point, we're not going to end up there because we're going to get pushed on our side by uh, the, the, the stream at that point. So therefore, we sort of like angle slightly into it and we sort of crab across that river. And you see ducks doing it, um, you know, against the, the stream or the wind. Um, and it's a concept we should really be practicing in our powerboats and motor cruisers as well, because effectively what we can do is make a boat go sideways. Um, so imagine here it's pointing totally up the page into the forces that are coming down. It could be wind, could be tide, could be both. Um, but by slightly offsetting the bow here to the right to starboard, then as we um, push forward ever so slightly, then the force coming down the page onto the port bow there um, is effectively creating two forces. One is down the page, the other is to the right, to starboard. So effectively, the down force cancels out the up force, and what we're left with is sideways force. And therefore, we can go from side to side across this stream, and that's called ferry gliding. It's another tool to have in your back pocket. You won't always be able to do it. You won't always be set up relative to the wind or tide to be able to do it. But if you're taking your boat out and there's uh, water movement, um, practice it. Uh, ideally, have two boys, put your boat between them, and then just practice that sort of slide backwards and forward. Uh, or have a boy, um, and as you get more confident, come up into the stream, come around the top of the boy, come down, slide, and box that boy off. So it's just a good good technique. And what you should be able to do is to sort of move and just touch the boy and then come back and touch the one the other side. So really practice that. It's a really handy technique. And if you're trying to get alongside a pontoon um, and there's some flow uh, through that area, you might well be able to use this just to shuffle the bow over and then slide alongside something. Excellent. Yeah, it's a really handy uh, uh, skill to use. And I I've used it so many times. So yeah, um, being able to hone, hone this skill, especially as a new boater, um, and it also gives you a little bit of time as well because these things happen to happen a little bit slowly. So yeah, it gives gives you a little bit of um, uh, pace to be able to see what's going on. Um, I think so that's the point you make there, Tom. It's a good one because it says you you talk about it as a boater starting off, and it's and this is the difference in terms of someone becoming a more advanced boater. It's what we're bringing in is loads of different tools and techniques and. And when you're starting off, the problem is almost you've got too many things to think of. Um, there's too many senses being uh, bombarded with information. And, and now you're getting to a stage, hopefully, where some of the simpler things are becoming muscle memory. Then it's having these tools in your toolbox that you can easily take out and apply. But therefore, by reminding you of them, then people will get to go out and practice them and then draw the right tool from the toolbox to do the right job at the right time. Yeah, it's honing that skill, isn't it? And I, I know certainly that there are areas of my boating which uh, I, I'm not up to scratch on simply because the majority of my boating is boat tests. It's, it's jumping on um, with a manufacturer or with a, with a new craft. We get out, we, we do the boat test for the magazine. So we may go on the water for three or four hours. We've got drones up, photo boats. We're doing fuel figures. We're doing a lot of that. Um, or it was previously a, a racing event or whatever. So it, it, it's a very, my, my time on the water is very, work orientated and there are certain skill sets that i use within that but also there are other things like for example night navigation which um i haven't done a night passage in six months or so 
Um, mm. So those type of things for each person will be different, but it's a real useful reminder, isn't it, to be able to hone our skills and, and develop other things or just have some useful reminders to be able to keep ourselves at a good high level. Absolutely. Um, so we want to talk now a little bit about uh, twin uh, shaft engines. Um, so I'm going to bring in, uh, we've obviously spoken about the uh, the outboards um, and we've, we've touched on in and out of gear on, on the, the two separate engines. But what, what do we see here? Yeah, well, I think to a large extent, we've probably covered uh, most of this anyway. And the, and the difference, I suppose, outdrives, outboards, twins, is that we rotate those uh, outdrive legs uh, to direct the thrust where we want that thrust to go. Here with the shafts, then the, we've got a shaft, we've got a propeller on the end, we can't change where that thrust is pointing. And we have behind that a rudder, um, past which water flows, which creates our steerage. Um, the thing about twin shaft boats is, generally speaking, the shafts will be, because you're on a bigger boat, will be slightly further apart, and that's giving you greater leverage. A general rule of thumb is if the separation between the engines is a meter or less, then sometimes you can sort of struggle to, to get good leverage effect because there's not a huge amount of offset. That said, in fairness, you know, there are some boats that handle really well with, with just under a meter sort of offset. Uh, sorry, a difference between the two. So what we've got here is these twin shafts and just the concept of um, actually using engines against each other. So here, uh, what we're doing is rotating the bow, or rotating the boat to starboard, and we've gone um, ahead on port and a stern on starboard. Um, and this has some additional effects with the shaft drive boats because effectively, when you put um, a shaft uh, drive boat astern. So let's say we put the starboard engine astern, then it has two effects, one of which is the turning effect through leverage, but also the propeller sort of crabs its uh, way sideways. And we call that the paddle wheel or the prop wheel, uh, prop walk effect. So it's sort of like a paddle wheel on a steamer. So we go astern on um, the starboard side and it has the effect of sort of pulling the bottom of the boat, the back of the boat towards the port side. Conversely, if we go astern on port, um, then that has the effect of crabbing the boat towards starboard. So you've got these two effects. You've got the leverage and you've got the paddle wheel effect. Um, and then we can dial in steering as well. So we can actually make on a twin shaft boat a turn really in the boat's own length, a very tight turn. And what I tend to do is I tend to, driving a twin shaft boat, is center up the steering um, and just drive it on the engines. Uh, one engine against each other and turn. But then if I need a tighter turn or I'm not getting the turn I want, then I dial the steering in as an additional. So I sort of separate out those. So I'm not saying that's right because there will always be slightly different schools of thought on it. Um, but it's well worth jumping on a twin shaft boat and, and actually seeing how that actually works. And a lot of them will also have like a, a rudder gauge, won't they, as well? So you can see where your helm is positioned rather than obviously you haven't got outboards or anything that you can see so um, having a leg or, or rudder position is a useful gauge as well yeah and one of the things that we find is we jump on a lot of boats like twin shaft boats to do some additional training when people are finding it a little bit more challenging in a marina situation and one of the benefits of actually just leaving the steering centered is it reduces the number of things you need to think about also don't particularly subscribe to two hands on throttle you see a lot of people starboard port um, and doing two hands well their brain is having to manage the individual actions of these two hands. I'll tend to find it easier um, and I quite often solve a lot of problems with people say, look, take that second hand out of the equation and just use one and just move your hand from whichever throttle you actually need and it becomes that one in gear, that one in gear, that one neutral. And, and it actually then is your brain is only having to manage one thing because if you think of two hands plus you doing the steering, you've got loads of variables. You think of one hand, then suddenly you've actually simplified it a bit. Again, it will vary person to person as to what works. Cool. So uh, we have one of these last uh, photos before we start to move on to then uh, using lines with the boat. Um, what's another practical example here that we see of another, another scenario that people may come across? Yeah, I think um, this one, uh, if I can see it correctly, it's uh, basically just the concept of using those, those engines against each other. And in yeah. this situation, we're trying to come away from the pontoon. Uh, so what we've done is rotated the bow in towards the pontoon. Um, so rather than just trying to sort of reverse straight out from the pontoon, by rotating the bow into the pontoon and using that curved shape of the bow 
to get the bow slightly closer, and then you're giving yourself a far better angle of exit. So don't hesitate to actually roll a bow towards a pontoon. It needs to be fendered, or you need to be sure it's not going to touch, and then coming out with a better, better angle of exit. Um, and that can really help if you've got a boat really close behind you. And then as we'll go on to, we can actually add lines into the equation to, to add to that as well. Yes, so this is what I was going to show. So um, people may uh, see a line attached to the boat and to the pontoon and think, what well, that's going on here? So can you explain uh, yeah, what, what we're seeing here and why this scenario may be really useful? Yeah, so uh, springs, the use of springs um, is something that's touched on at the basic courses, but like anything, there's not an awful lot of time to, to do all these things. So um, as you become more advanced, you're going to want to think through how you actually use springs to your advantage. So what we've got here is we've got what's called a forward spring. And by forward spring, we mean it arrests the forward movement of the boat. And we've got it from the bollard in the center of that uh, uh, bow on the rib there back to a position about midships on the pontoon. Um, and you can see wind coming down the page. It could be wind, could be tide, could be both. And that's holding the boat on. And we've got a boat behind and we've got a boat in front. Um, so we need to get that backside of the boat out so we can actually exit um, up into the wind. And the technique used here um, is simply to actually arrest the forward movement of the boat and then to turn towards the pontoon, go into gear and roll the bow into the pontoon um, it needs to be properly fended, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And then the stern is pushed outwards um, to a point where you've got a good angle of exit, and then you're going to need to drop that line quickly and reverse out into the clear water. Um, we've got a picture of a rib here, and I'm sort of generally trying not to roll uh, the bow of a rib against a pontoon because there's a risk of damage. A lot of people are saying, oh, it's a rib, it's got tubes, that's what they're there for. Well, if anyone's ever paid to have a set of rib tubes repaired, uh, it's a lot cheaper to use fenders. Um, and fenders are better, but it's quite difficult sometimes to position fenders uh, at the bow of a rib. So as a general rule of thumb, I'll try not to push the tubes of a rib against a pontoon. I'll do it with a hard boat, but far less so with a rib. Um, with a rib, I'd sort of generally try, and I could take that line from the bollard forward there, turn to, in this case, starboard and go astern and have just the same effect, but be pulling the rib away from the pontoon and therefore not impacting the pontoon. So it's just different techniques. Um, and it's just being mindful of what boat you're on and the pros and cons of doing what you're thinking about doing. Yeah, it's a good point regarding uh, rib collars. And uh, although they're, they're pretty strong, you don't really want to be having bills for re-gluing rubbing strakes and or just even just scar your, your nice set of tubes. A lot of tubes are fabric compression, which look lovely. They're beautiful for the super yacht market. For the high-end family boats, they're very, very popular, but also they can kind of show up any mark as well. So uh, yeah, yeah. Well, GRP, you know, there's, there's people here in the marina, I mean, who can make the GRP, you know, fix a bit of GRP and you'd never know they've even touched it. The problem with a rib tube is, you've got no choice but to patch it and it will never look the same again. Um, and that's, you know, that, that sticks out like a sore thumb. So avoid it if you, if you can. Yeah. So this is uh, the same principle applied, but what's, what's different in this? Theory? Yeah, so what's different here is here you can see the force of the wind or the tide coming up from the pontoon and pushing the bow off. So this is a classic situation where, you know, we struggle to get alongside a pontoon because the forces are pushing us off. And it's just provoking that thought in you of actually thinking about using spring lines to get on. Now, in this example, uh, with this hard boat, we've reversed up to the pontoon. And I remember the first time I was shown this, it was just like, wow, that's just so brilliant. Um, we've reversed up to the pontoon. Uh, we've stood in the cockpit area and we've lassoed the cleat. So we've not attempted to get someone onto that pontoon. But we've lassoed the cleat, brought it back on board and tied it off. And we've hung off that pontoon, my baby six foot, 10 foot, whatever. And then we turn in this case, hard to starboard and just in gear tick over and the bow will be driven alongside that pontoon. We need to make sure we've got enough room at the stern that the line is long enough that any bathing platform or that doesn't engage with the pontoon. But here we can sort of drive it in. We could do it the other way and ribs are classic for this in you could generally got good bow access. So in that case, you drive bow towards the pontoon, lasso the, lasso the cleat, bring it back on board um, and then turn towards the pontoon and gentle into reverse and bring the stern of the boat in towards the pontoon. So great techniques, well worth practicing and another tool to have in your toolbox. We're going to show uh, a couple different uh, slides um, to round this session off. Um, but uh, these ones are showing uh, marina uh, maneuvers, which we've obviously been discussing throughout this uh, stream. But can you um, 
sort of talk us through this visual representation and, and I'll I'll slowly put the rest of the slides up up in order. Yeah, so so it's just introducing some different uh, concepts. And I think the first one here is about reading the environment. It's about looking at what you're about to face. So you're coming into a situation where there are some births. Um, what way is the wind going? What way is the tide going? What depth of water do I have? What other boats there are? And then that concept of uh, births that we would refer to as an instructor of closed births or open births. If I can see the face of a berth, I'd refer to it as open. If I cannot see, if I'm looking really at the backside of that berth, then I'm seeing a closed face pontoon. Now, that's not a problem necessarily, uh, but if I'm gonna go into a closed uh, berth, then probably my momentum, my momentum is gonna carry me away from that because I'm coming from the, the other side of it, as it were. So an option will be to go around, turn, and make that an open berth, so my momentum is gonna be carrying me onto that berth. Uh, it's just making an assessment, isn't it? It's sort of, we shouldn't go in and just charge it in like a bull in a china shop and just start coming alongside. We need to actually take that step back, have a look around, assess the types of berths and go from there. And then what we've got on the next image, um, if I can see this, is the concept of it sort of going wrong. Um, and it's just another tool to have in your pocket. So we've got the boat uh, coming in from the right hand side of the image there. Um, and the wind's coming from the bottom of the page. And, and it happens to us all. We get just a little distracted and the boat gets pushed towards those finger pontoons and it's getting closer. And then there's the outboard trimmed up off another boat that's a damn big sharp piece of metal pointing at your, uh, your boat. And the temptation here is to turn to the left, to turn to port and to power away, to get away from that risk. Um, and I'm not saying that's wrong um, because there will be a time where it's the right thing to do. If you've got enough time and space to do it, it could be correct. But one of the counterintuitive things that you can do is in this situation, in the little part of the image just to the left there, is look for a space where you could put the bow and counterintuitively turn towards the risk. So in this case, turn to starboard and put that bow into the space. What that's then done is pushed your bum out so it's giving you a better angle of exit. Um, and then straighten up the wheel and you might have to use a little bit more than tick over here uh, to actually get the boat out. But then you're pulling the boat away from that risk and potentially holding the, the stern to win. So that's one to practice. I wouldn't do it for real next to other people's boats, but um, putting it into practice is, is a good one. What we've then got is just some examples of coming into situations. And we've got the wind coming from about the one, two o'clock position here. Um, and we've got boats coming into to various of these berths. And it's if we look at the one on the left first, and we've got the rib, oh, we'll say rib A boat, we can't really tell it's a rib, seeking to reverse in. And the wind is starting to get on the side of that boat and pushing it towards the corner of that pontoon. Contrast that with the, the green outlined boat, where it's positioning itself stern to wind, and it's reversing up and then turning to sort of almost flick the bow up into the wind to hold the bow against the wind and then going back into that slot. I'm not saying one's right or wrong, but it's actually just thinking about how's my boat gonna to react to the conditions I'm actually facing here. Um, and then ditto really doing the one on the right in the same way. Again, if you think about the way the boat wants to lie 90 degrees to the wind, you're trying to go into that berth by going straight up the boat in red, but the bow wants to drop off to port to lie 90 degrees to the wind. Conversely, coming from the green position and steering into the wind and then just getting into the berth and then let the bow flop away helps you to actually get into that berth. There are so many different scenarios, we can't model every one of them, but it's just having that thought process that helps you uh, to do things. And then we've got this other image, uh, which is just some of the same ideas. We've got the wind from the roughly the same position again, um, and it's just thinking about how you're setting up. So the one in the middle at the bottom, for example, it's you're going into a berth, you've got wind up your bum and pushing you off the berth at the same time. So you really need to get a line on. Um, and actually an overlooked line quite often is a line for midships. It doesn't actually always work on a rib because you don't have a midships cleat very often or something to tie onto, but you're going into that berth, you lasso the first cleat you get to, and then you let that line extend a bit and you use it as a forward spring to actually prevent and arrest your forward movement. And because you've limited the length of that line such that you can't touch the, the end of the berth, as it were, it actually naturally brings you alongside. So there's a few different ideas there. Um, it's impossible to model every situation, but it's important that we don't almost try to find a solution to each individual berth, because what you need is the tools and the mental thought process 
to deal with every birth. You need the tools to do the job, not a, this is what I do with that birth in that situation. Try and approach it as each individual situation as, as you face them. I like what you say also when we were talking about the throttles and having both hands on and, and over overfilling your brain with so many different things going on. In these different scenarios, it's best where you've got a little bit of car, uh, quiet area of water before making your, your move to make sure your lines are ready, fenders are out, that you're you're breaking down those components, aren't you? So that then you can focus on what the wind's doing or, or, or where you're, you're placing your boat rather than having a million things all happening at the same time. So like that middle cleat, um, I know, uh, uh, yeah, like a lot of uh, most cruisers may have a, um, a wheelhouse uh, door by the by the helm. There's quite often their midship cleat positioned right there. So having having a fender on there and also a rope ready to go, um, those type of things. So you're prepared, um, ready to um, make those positions accordingly. It's a really good point, actually, Tom. And, and I was doing some training on two days ago, and we we're on a four birth family cruiser type thing. And and you had the sacrificial partner that is generally put on the bow, and the bow is sloping like that, and there's a cleat and there's a little rail. But actually, they don't need to muck around with the bow cleat, mm -hmm. midships and the stern cleat, particularly the stern one, because you're in the safety of the cockpit and you're lassoing a line. And if you've not done lassoing a line yet, then have a look on YouTube um, and really it should be a lasso. You shouldn't be leaping off boats. It never ceases to amaze me the number of people I see leaping off boats. And you'll get away with it nine times in ten. It's that one time when you get really hurt and it's just not worth it. Um, so getting techniques that are low risk that are proven and as you rightly say tom it's sort of getting the children sitting down getting all the lines briefing people making sure that the phone's on silent because sod's law says it always goes when you're 15 foot away from a berth always get a call when i'm about to put a boat on a trailer yeah you and me too <laughs> um so everybody thank you so much for watching today and um paul thank you uh, a lot for your time uh, and um we hope that these uh, different techniques will be able to advance your skill set and be able to uh, hone in and uh, be able to make your boating experience more pleasurable um, by gaining experience and understanding and being more familiar with how the boat moves in wind, how the different drive systems affect the boat um, and how you can position your craft accordingly, depending on all the different scenarios that you have. And like Paul said, uh, we can't obviously simulate all the different types of um, scenarios that you'll come across through your boating life, but by being familiar with how the boat um, uh, is um, uh, controlled in these different environments will give you a good basis to be able to um, uh, come across the right technique for the situation that you find yourself in. Do things slowly, practice when it's safe to do so, and maybe on a quieter day, um, go out with maybe a more experienced um, friend, um, like we've said on the, the um, going further afield episode. Um, Paul, are there any other um, tips that we should round off on on this? No, and, and one of the often overlooked things, and it's a, a phrase I stole uh, years ago from, uh, from someone, which is let the boat do the work. You know, mm -hmm. quite often it just happens to be going where you want it to and the real temptation is to go into gear and then that spoils it. You know, let the boat do the work. If it's going there, just let it happen. And if that happens slowly... You don't get any prizes for happening fast. Um, it's about being safe, safe and controlled. And I'll just leave you on this, uh, this with maybe a little, a little story, which is a lovely uh, way of putting it across. There was doing some training years ago, and there was someone coming alongside a pontoon, um, and it wasn't totally pretty, but it was totally safe. And the person was beating themselves up unnecessarily. And um, I turned around to them and said, "Look, don't be so unfair on yourself. It was good. It was safe. It might be prettier the next time." And this person turned around and said. Yeah, me and my partner have a small plane. Every landing we survive is a good landing. Yeah. And, and actually, it's true with boating. You know, it won't always be pretty, but let's just make it always safe. Yeah, and when you do make a mistake, it does happen. To, to the most experienced people I've seen all around the world have all still made mistakes. So uh, you're not going to get it right every time. But by being slow, by being prepared, um, you're going to hopefully keep your family safe. You're not going to damage your boat. You're not going to damage other people's boats. And uh, one other thing that I, I would like to probably bring out is a lot of marina operators, um, especially like non-council uh, owned ones like MDL, uh, Premier, um, Dean and Redderhoff, et cetera, and, and, and others, um, they will um, quite often have a, a dock master or um, somebody on hand in the week 
that is checking the boats and, and working the pontoons. So if you are wanting to focus on something uh, in particular, maybe just give them a call or let them know what you're doing that day. Um, because quite often, if they have got time, they're obviously very, very busy individuals, but if they have got five minutes or something, they may help you with your lines and just um, give you a little bit of um, uh, guidance that you've got somebody on shore that's obviously very experienced. I'm not saying that dock masters are all RA instructors and they've got, they're have got they very busy <laughs> on their own jobs, but by calling ahead and just letting them know you're, you're doing some practice, sometimes they are, are really helpful to help out their members. I don't know if you find that, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. It varies hugely in terms of experience, but uh, people end up being dock masters in marinas generally because they've got a real passion for boats. And that generally means they've got a boat or had a boat um, and they're more than happy to share. Um, and equally, they're quite keen on protecting their marinas as well. So they're very keen to assist. Yeah, great. OK, so thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, we will be back next week with another episode. Um, these episodes now are kind of really gearing up your boating and advancing these different techniques. We also have um, planned um, a new vessel, which uh, we're going to be announcing shortly, which uh, Paul and I will be doing some content around to be able to show you some out of classroom style uh, techniques of what we've been teaching also. Um, if you haven't already, look back on the PBR TV. If you search on that on YouTube or our Facebook page, you will see the previous nine episodes. There are different topics that talk about going offshore, uh, rough weather handling, um, understanding uh, uh, tide systems and your charts, etc., using radio. Um, so there are lots of different topics there. So if you've missed any of those, uh, make sure that you have a look back through because there's loads of content there that will hopefully hone your skills uh, to be a more experienced boater. Likewise, on our live streams, we have live streams coming up with uh, Honda, with Yamaha, uh, with Ray Marine, and many other brands. So uh, make sure that you keep an eye on our PBR TV live sessions. But that's all from Paul and I this evening, and thank you very much for joining us, and see you again 